Okay, um, so hi everyone. Thanks for joining us in this panel and Q&A event. I'm from the Marine Biology Society, a student organization that encourages people to learn about marine life and spread awareness on conservation. We share updates on recent discoveries in marine biology, create resources for students interested in a career in marine biology and more. So if you're interested, check out our website. Um, well, today we have three panelists with us um, to talk about their work in marine science and share their experiences in their fields. So if you haven't watched our experiences in marine biology videos that contain more information about the panelists, they're available on our website. Today we'll get to know the panelists with introductions they prepared, go through a series of questions, and then open up the discussion for live Q&A where you guys can submit your questions through the chat. Hopefully by the end of the event, you'll get a better sense of what working in marine biology is like and how you can pursue this field. Again, please know that this event is recorded and will be made publicly available. Now we'll have the panelists introduce themselves. I can go first. <laughs> um, my name is Natalia and I'm a third year PhD student at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, and I'm originally from Ecuador. I moved to the United States about maybe almost maybe 10 years. Uh, and I'm in uh, the biological oceanography program and my research interests are um, marine um, microbiology. So I'm very interested in all those very tiny microorganisms that play a very important role in um, transforming all the kind of chemical reactions that happen in the ocean from looking at uh, primary productivity, but also how nutrients uh, get recycled in marine ecosystems. And at the moment, I'm looking at how um, the microbial community is sort of responding to different stressors in mangrove forests. Uh, mangrove forests are a very important ecosystems that uh, for the past year, it, it, there's been a lot of attention because they have the potential to kind of mitigate climate change. So uh, there's been a lot of kind of questions to better understand what might enable the systems to better trap carbon dioxide and kind of help us address some of the issues with climate change. And so some of my work involves looking at the microbial community in the water, but I also look at the microbial community in the soil. And I'm also interested in sort of the interactions between uh, mangrove forests and bacteria. So I'm also looking at the roots and see how the microbial community might be helped on them by bringing in nutrients and also maybe providing some sort of defense against pathogen. So uh, my name is Luke Fisher. I'm a second year PhD student at Scripps um, in the Mar marine biology department. Um, I started my undergrad at UConn where I studied marine sciences and that was mostly working with um, microbiology and microbialites, which is a uh, if anyone isn't familiar, they're, you can think of them in layman's terms, they're basically like these living rocks, kind of like you think of coral reefs with these um, calcareous, you know, outwards growth, uh, except these are similar in the sense that it's like still this calcium carbonate structure, but it's actually mediated by um, prokaryotes as well as like some euka eukaryotic um, micro, uh, microbes. So it's a bit of a different system. And uh, my interest in astrobiology I was, that's kind of like what got me into astrobiology because these microbialites are kind of these like windows to the first, some of the first organisms um, on earth, um, the first life. And from there, I did a lot of field work with these microbialites in upstate New York. And then I started right after undergrad uh, at Scripps doing a um, program with Doug Bartlett, who does deep sea, deep sea microbiology. And my research interests mostly focus with deep sea microbiology, so life at really high pressure, kind of at um, like the hadal depths, which you can imagine, I think it's like, ele like you know, the pressure equivalent of like 11 elephants standing on top of you, so like bottom of the ocean, 10,000 meters below sea level. And that also got me interested in astrobiology and working with um, these deep sea brine pools and looking at the relation of these deep sea brine pools on Earth um, and extrapolating out to other extraterrestrial bodies where in lab, my, a lot of my lab work involves trying to evolve microbes to adapt to these really stressful environments um, and see what genetic changes they're undergoing to allow them to survive in that environment. Hi guys, I'm Emily. Um, and I'm a little bit different from Natalia and Luke in that I'm not a PhD student and a researcher. Um, I'm more of an independent contractor um, and in the field of fisheries science. And um, 
I don't have any research of my own. I started off um, more as a field tech, um, as a um, fisheries observer for NOAA. And I still do that. Um, and I have a couple of other projects that I work on that have to do with evaluating the carbon impacts of different fisheries locally and globally, um, a little bit of um, seafood tracing and um, quite a bit of um, economic uh, and risk assessment studies looking into how to generate more value from sustainable fisheries locally um, and domestically. So um, some of my work requires me to be at sea for long periods of time working directly with fishermen and then the other bulk of my work is a lot of literature review and interacting with academics. Um, yeah, and uh, that's about it. All right, thank you panelists for um, sharing a bit about yourself and your research. Um, so now we prepared a series of questions um, that we'd love to hear more about. So I'll just begin by asking, how did you get started in marine sciences? I could, I could go first if that's all right, Emily and Natalia. Um, I, I guess I started out as a, as a kid. I grew up in Cape Cod, which if, if, if there's any East Coasters out there, it's um, in Massachusetts. It's kind of like a small coastal town. And I guess I was just basically grew up on the ocean. And throughout high school, I, I joined the, um, the Ocean Bowl team, which was essentially like a quiz bowl style um, science team where we just competed at state competitions and basically learned all about the ocean. And that kind of got me interested in the fact that there is, um, there's basically nothing, there's, there's very little known about the ocean. Um, there's still a lot more to explore and we're, we're finding out stuff every single day. So I kind of got into it because I realized it was this really um, important field, especially for um, just our climate and like the health of the, the whole earth that there's a lot to learn. It's kind of like another frontier of science. I kind of viewed it, which got me more into like the deep sea extremophile work. And then later on the astrobiology with um, my undergrad professor. For me was, um, I, I think I tried a lot of different things before I actually knew that marine science was what I wanted to do. Um, I, mean, I have always been interested in um, marine ecosystems. Um, I grew up in, in Ecuador in like close to the coastal region of my country and so I spent a lot of like time when I was little um, kind of exploring uh, the ecosystem but it wasn't really until like after a couple years that I knew I wanted to do marine science. Um, I initially thought I wanted to do um, political science and um, I'm still kind of interested in policy but um, I just didn't kind of figure out that you know, how I wanted to connect it with um, marine science. And it was through a different um, kind of volunteer opportunities and working in uh, labs that I kind of found my interests. And um, it was mainly through that. I was, uh, I was doing just environmental biology for my undergrad, but I started working in a lab um, where they were looking at bacteria in the ocean. And since I started working there, I it was just, it was very interesting to me. And um, I think that was really what kind of uh, got me into deciding to kind of pursue marine science as a, a career. And for me, um, I grew up going out on my father's fishing vessel, sport fishing vessel uh, here in California. And um, he would also bring home a lot of sea sea life. He tried to keep them whole for me um, as, so I could dissect them and look through fish stomachs at a very early age. So uh, I had some strange interests growing up and I knew, I pigeonholed myself pretty early and knew that I wanted to do um, marine science or, or I was really focused on, on tropical ecosystems at the time too. So I studied abroad as an undergraduate um, I spent a lot of time in Central and South America and um, realized how hard it was going to be for me to find consistent field work um, and made sort of a transition into fisheries work um, because I saw that there was 
such a need for um, for human based applications and, and that I might actually find uh, opportunities there. And I had some really important mentors that fostered that journey and um, somehow made economics and statistics really interesting to me for the first time. Um, so that's how I got to where I am now. All right, thank you for sharing. So now let's move on to our next question, which is what, what were your biggest challenges and how did you overcome them? I, I think there are many, I don't think there's like one challenge as a PhD student, there are kind of challenges um, every time because uh, you know, if you're doing like a new experiment, you'll encounter new challenges. If you're trying to get funding for a project, there's like all kinds of different challenges. Um, I think like something that kind of seems common in all of those challenges is that uh, facing rejection is really difficult, but it's something that you have to learn to cope with it because it's going to happen. You know, sometimes you you don't get the grant that you want or like, you know, you're working an experiment or it's not working or like, you know, even uh, when I was in college, like I, there were other labs that I wanted to volunteer and I, so I emailed a bunch of professors, but some of them never replied to me. So just be aware that there'll be times that, you know, you're not going to get the answer that you're looking for, but that doesn't, like, don't let that discourage you because, um, it's a very competitive field, so you just have to be, just know that that's going to happen and like kind of learn from that and figure out, okay, maybe this is what I need, why this didn't work, like figure out what you can do to improve and be able to kind of achieve what you uh, were trying to do. Yeah, I guess I would add, um, I, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint one specific challenge, but I guess if I were to break it down in terms of in undergraduate, um, I I kind of knew I wanted to get into the scientists and sciences and go into a PhD program after undergrad. So that kind of made me realize that you, you really have to work, um, they work extremely hard just to get, you know, good grades, um, do really well in your classes. And then again, just reach out as Natalia said, like reach out to a lot of professors. Um, I think a lot of it is just, you gotta, you you got you definitely have to really grind and like do really well in classes as well as like try to get some lab experience um i think that's how i felt in undergrad and then also with in the phd program a lot of it is like it's extremely independent and you have to really um you kind of have to have a lot of self-motivation and then deal with a lot of failures and confusion as well as like I, I, some of the best students that I know will even, you know, everyone will get rejected from a certain grant application or something like that. So I think independence is like the, one of the biggest challenges. And for me, um, post undergraduate, I didn't, I didn't want to go to, into a postgraduate program um, and I wanted to work in the field. And my biggest challenge was finding work. Uh, I had to really scratch and um, a huge part of it was networking and building skills on my own time. So I had to really develop myself um, at, like it was a full-time job um, and talk to as many people as possible and really put myself out there. I even flew up to Alaska um, and worked a little bit in the fishing industry up there in order to get that kind of like background experience um, and, and contacts in the fishing industry to make myself more valuable to people that might want to hire me for fisheries work. All right, thank you. Um, and we're going to move on to our next question, um, which is, as you were pursuing the path of, or the field of marine biology, uh, did you find any sources of inspiration or role models that you looked up to? My biggest role model has always been Jane Goodall. <laughs> yeah, ever since I was a child. Um, and I don't really have, I admire Jacques Cousteau a lot and read a lot of his books, of course. But honestly, Jane Goodall was the biggest influence and John Steinbeck, actually. John Steinbeck, author of The Log from the Sea of Cortez um, and his uh, account of his best friend and marine biologist, um, what's his name? Ed, I forget. But anyway, just phenomenal accounts of um, field science and collecting trips that really inspired me when I was young. 
Uh, I guess I was um, inspired. I, in high school, I volunteered at this uh, the Center for Coastal Studies in in Cape Cod, and I had I had the fortune to I heard some talks from Bill Nye as well as Sylvia Earle, and that was that was really cool to hear them talk about marine science specifically. And then, I guess in undergrad, I was also kind of inspired by my my mentor slash undergraduate advisor who. I thought he just did, he did a really good job just kind of like teaching me, you know, what it really is to be a scientist and like how to get your experience out the door and just kind of like all the steps. And I thought it was um, just pretty impressive how he would go about that. And I really, I just, I don't know. I just thought that was going to be a good, a good field for me. It's not boring. It's definitely, <laughs> I think that's the best part. It's, it's it, even though it's like, it is a grind and you really have to work hard at it. It's very, there's a lot of, different stuff that you do in the, in at least the PhD program. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I um, just echo also, you know, from some of the great people that Emily and Luke had mentioned, um, a lot of like naturalists, just Jane Goodall or Sylvia Earle. Um, but I also think for me was, um, I guess my parents, because they had been, there were certain skills of like just um, being really like working really hard and just um, find what you're passionate and you know try to um, achieve those goals so kind of seeing my parents um, um, going through like different struggles to be able to help me and be there where I am and I think for them they had been a, also one of my biggest source of inspiration. All right, thank you. Um, so Dr. Matt, would you like to give a really uh, brief introduction about yourself, um, what you do and uh, your current research? Um, yeah, first of all, uh, I want to apologize for being late. My name is Matt Edwards. I'm a professor of biology at San Diego State University, and I'm the director of the, uh, um, the emphasis coordinator for the marine biology undergraduate program there. Um, <clears throat> I did my um, graduate work at uh, UC Santa Barbara and then my master's work at Moss Landing Marine Labs uh, through San Francisco State. And then I did uh, my PhD at UC Santa Cruz and I've been at the, on the faculty at San Diego State for about 20 years now. My research focuses primarily on uh, coastal ecology, um, primarily disturbance and environmental impacts in the coast. And I work mostly in kelp forest systems, although we work at a Catalina Island in Coral and Algo Bed. So um, a lot of my work has been in Mexico and in Alaska the past uh, 20 years or so. So um, that's a little bit about, uh, about my background. Um, and um, apologies if there was a question for uh, beyond that. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, so we're gonna move on to another question. So is there anything you wish you would have known about uh, marine biology before going uh, into this path, into the field? Um, and, and then also any advice um, that you would give us on like what we should take, make note of um, before joining this field? Um, something that I, I really wish I knew beforehand was that if you, if you want to get into the marine sciences or and just in the field of marine biology, well, I guess if you're very, very set on marine biology, I guess in, when I think of marine biology, I usually think of people that are studying um, like the macro fauna, like the, the large organisms rather than like the microbes, even though if they're still in the ocean. But uh, besides that point, um, what I learned was actually a lot of my friends in the PhD program, most of them had no background in marine science when they were an undergrad. A lot of them just did biology or chemistry or they just did like another hard science or like environmental science. Um, so if, I guess what I'm saying is like, you don't have to necessarily like get into a marine sciences program if your goal out of college is to like work in a, you know, like, a, you know, go to a PhD program at like Scripps or another oceanographic institute. And I guess the reason I say that is because when I was applying to graduate schools, a lot of the requirements are to have like, um, you know, like biochemistry or these higher level chemistry classes or math classes. But in my program at the marine sciences, they didn't really require that. So I felt like when I applied to PhD programs for marine sciences, um, I was kind of lacking in a couple check boxes. But 
it still worked out to say the least. Um, yeah, similar to what Luke was saying and um, someone asked in the chat as well, I think they asked about what kind of classes do you take when you're in college? Do you want to do marine science? And, you know, it might happen. So in my, where I did my undergrad, like there was not a marine science major. So I major in environmental biology and I took all kind of different like chemistry and biology. And like, it does happen that a lot of people that end up going to do their PhD in marine science come from like a, either have done biology or chemistry or any other of the science in their undergrad. And so with that, I think um, something that I wish you would know is that, you know, it's not that there's anything like set, like, oh, if you want to do a marine science, this is what you should do or what classes to take. It's always good to just like um, be open and like try different classes. And of course, um, when you apply to uh, graduate programs, they're going to look that you have like uh, some kind of foundational from like a chemistry, biology, math. So taking a little bit of like, you know, biology, chemistry, and math classes are always really helpful. Something that um, is good, and I think uh, I, I took, this was in my last year of undergrad, was a coding class. And coding is, it's a great skill. So if you at any point have a chance to kind of take a class or anything, I totally recommend it because um, as you go into marine science, like processing data is like a big um, factor. And um, especially in my field, like I do a lot of microbial genetics. And so there's been a lot of new advancement with the te technology. And so we do have this huge data sets that we need to, to be able to process them. So um, having some background in coding definitely kind of helps. And um, yeah, if there's a class that you feel like um, maybe you feel like afraid of trying it, I would say just go for it. Because I feel like the classes that I felt a little bit scared that I wasn't sure I could do with them were the classes that I kind of learned the most. Um, I would add something to that. If, uh, is this, uh, sorry, Wani, is this kind of going in a round robin here? I missed the rules at the beginning, sorry. Um, <clears throat> one thing that, you know, um, was just said about being open, um, being open-minded is the one thing I think is the, probably the most surprising thing to me as I moved through my career. <clears throat> when I was younger, um, for example, I took a class in plant biology in botany, and I did not like it. I did not like botany. I, it wasn't exciting to me. I thought it was boring. Um, you know, it, was just, it was one of these classes I felt I had to take you know, to get my degree, my undergraduate degree. Um, and getting into my career, you know, I was a, um, a subtitled ecologist, um, swimming translates, doing experiments underwater. But um, I worked, started working with some colleagues of mine actually from Korea that were out here for several years, and they started bringing a physiology side to my lab. And that opened up this whole side of botany into my lab, photosynthesis, plant, um, genetics, plant pigments, um, the way plants grow, the way they reproduce. Um, and I now look back and it's one of the most exciting things to me. Um, you know, it's something that I started off just, you know, it was just like pulling teeth, um, trying to um, get through the material because um, I wasn't excited. But excitement, you know, passion for it came later. So keep, your, keep an open mind. Um, the things, you know, that you do now, you don't like, you may not be the most interesting for you now, but um, give it another chance sometime, you know, with a different approach. Um, and um, I think you'll find that it's going to take you places that you, you're, you're unexpected, that are unexpected. I second that, Matt, um, especially with what you said, Natalia, in regards to coding um, and for myself, statistics and economics. So these are two subjects that I didn't, I was focused on keeping my grades high so that I could go to graduate school and not really so much about taking classes that I, where I didn't think that I would like this, the, um, the subject matter or that would be too challenging for me. And I wish that I could go back and take those classes, take more classes um, in those disciplines, because now um, I have to teach them to myself, and that's actually uh, pretty hard, pretty hard to squeeze in, what with um, trying to work and everything else. Kind of going off of our previous topic of taking classes um, and working in the lab, um, someone asked in the chat, what kind of lab experiences are involved in studying marine biology in college? Um. 
I, I, I mentioned a bit in the chat of what I had to do, but so specifically I was a marine sciences major and I went to UConn Avery Point, which is a entirely, well, there's some other major majors, but the entire focus of the campus is just marine sciences. There was about, I think, a uh, hundred undergrads. So it's a pretty small program, but it, it, it was a huge range because I had some friends that literally just wash tubes like they were just in lab and they wash tubes and like that's still a good way to like get in so you can you know um, have a reference and just have a little bit of lab experience but um, I think it really just depends because there's so many fields within marine biology so I was more in microbiology so um, I was able to do like some genetics as well as some molecular biology um, all you know pretty basic but then I was able to do a lot of field work which was just kind of luck based because my professor needed a student. He didn't have an undergraduate uh, student at the time. But I think it really just depends of, on like um, how much you bother a professor in a way. Like if you're interested in one person's lab, just like keep asking. And if they don't respond to you in like two weeks, you know, it doesn't mean that they're ignoring you. They might just forget because usually professors are flooded by emails. But um, I also had some friends that did like fish dissections. And then I had some other friends that just counted algae and counted cells and worked with microplastics so there's definitely I would say there's definitely something for everybody in terms of like the marine sciences specifically as a as a field when you're an undergrad yeah I also just um you know same I mean there, there'll be class depending on you know what do you decide to major where you will have to take certain um you know, lab classes, like if you do uh, intro to bio or chemistry, but um, trying to find labs where you can volunteer is probably where you're going to like actually put whatever skills you're learning in your classes at test. So um, it's, also, it's just a great um, opportunity to just try to find a lab and volunteer. And even if you kind of find a lab that you might feel like, oh, maybe this is like not with my particular interest. When I was an undergrad, I volunteered in a lab that were, um, they were interested in paleoclimate. And so what we did, what I did was mostly just smash rocks until I get them into a very fine sediment. And then they would later process to look for certain chemical signals. And I didn't really like that as much. It was a very painful <laughs> work, but I, I, I really liked the people in the lab. Um, the PIs were really friendly and the grad students. And overall, I think I learned a lot of like, just uh, um, time management and like, how do I organize my uh, lab area? Like what are kind of the steps I need to do if I'm processing samples? And so you learn certain skills that you can later apply, you know, uh, when you work on a, a different kind of project or something that could be more um, relatable to what you would want to do. Yeah, I think there's a huge diversity of lab experiences and it's going to depend on, on what your interests are um, that are going to shape that. And for example, I worked a lot in the field um, in, in intertidal work and I collected samples there and um, I prepared them. I looked at them under the microscopes. I did a lot of um, identification based on taxonomy and what I learned from it was really valuable to to be irritating enough to get to do more than um you know like wash glassware like luke was saying uh and it to some degree that manifests when you like insist that or demonstrate your value to um the professors that that are around you the and the researchers that are around you because they're just so busy with their own projects that they might not take the time to like figure out what you can possibly do. So you need to go to them and, and try to figure out a way in which you can be helpful. And I definitely learned through that how challenging field work can be um, by always volunteering. You know, sometimes it was like 3 a.m. and there was a winter storm and we had to be out, you know, getting destroyed by waves in the intertidal zone. and that's the reality sometimes of field work and marine biology. So it's good to get that first experience. Um, yeah, I would e echo that. Uh, you know, the options for, or the opportunities for doing things um, at local, you know, universities is pretty extensive if you go knocking on doors. Um, what Emily got to do out there, you know, getting knocked out in the waves at three in the morning, <clears throat> 
you got to get you got to get in line for those kinds of things because you know you do start off um, doing some um, you know some kind of repetitive stuff. When I was an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara, I picked critters out of mud samples through a microscope um, for five hours a day. Be you know, I did that for a couple of years before I started going out to the Channel Islands and dive um, and do some field work. Um, I can tell you that at San Diego State, um, we do have um, you know opportunities for undergraduates to go through labs. I'm, I know I've had about 55 or 60 undergraduates go through my lab. Um, and you get units for it. You know, when you're in a lower division, you can get lower division units. Um, which you kind of, they just count as units. But when you're an upper division student, they can count towards your degree. Um, and you can do all sorts of things. And you know, we have students, you know, picking through seagrass samples. Um, I have students that, you know, took on independent projects on sea urchins and looking at the respiration. And they're getting a scientific publication out of it right now. Um, so, the, you know, the opportunities... Um, are really endless. But what I would say is that you've got to go knocking on the doors, you know. Um, the, yeah, the faculty, we are, you know, as you've heard, I'm, I'm on that other side of the fence. I'm, you know, we're very busy running labs. We have all sorts of things going on. Um, and so, you know, students that are proactive, um, if you, you know, have the courage to go knock on the door and say, yes, I want to volunteer in your lab. Even if you're not an undergraduate in the university, you know, you can do things as a volunteer and get involved. Um, there's a lot of opportunities um, that you you got to step forward and be your best, uh, your your own advocate for that. I was just I was just going to add to that. I um, I had to send out tons of emails to professor and you professors and usually don't get any response. But I would say it, there is a point where you kind of have to, you know, you, you kind of have to grind and you might just be you, you have to be insisting. But there might just be a period where you're doing like one monotonous task for like six months or something. But, you know, as long as you're putting your foot in the door and you're actually advocating and saying you want more then it will definitely come to you. And one thing that I like to do, sorry to extend this question, but um, if I felt intimidated or if I couldn't get a hold of somebody that I wanted to work with or learn more about their research, I would actually check to see if they were teaching any classes. Sometimes they were, and usually those classes were courses for graduate students or um, had prerequisites that I hadn't met yet as a early career um, undergraduate. And so I would go and ask to audit the class or just depending on the volume of the class, sneak in um, and afterwards talk to the professor a little bit about auditing or demonstrating my interest. And then that was the first step in building a relationship with that person and potentially getting to work with them or showing up at their lab or scheduling appointments where we could talk more about what we could do together, or what opportunities they might have for me. So strategy. <laughs> yeah, I want to say same with what Emily, like taking a class or sometimes, you know, if I had a good relationship with a professor, I will ask him, you know, about a certain, if who would he or she recommend on a certain field. Something else that I did was to go to seminars and try to ask questions. And a lot of times it was very intimidating because I was like, oh, is this a good question? And sometimes I'll be afraid to ask them during the whole talk. But then I would like wait at the end and like try to talk to the professor who was presenting. And that's always like a good way to introduce yourself and try to kind of network and get some um, experience in, in the lab. I'd also say uh, um, when you get to undergrad and you want to work in a lab, talk to your TAs for your lab courses. I think that's really important. Um, that's how I originally got to my lab position by talking to my, my TA for intro to marine sciences. I would definitely um, uh, echo that. You know, the, the TAs, the graduate students in our department um, are great conduits to um, find out what's going on. You know, um, they often have their finger on the pulse uh, much better than we do because they're in their the labs every day and they are they're interacting with everyone and they kind of know the breadth of what everyone's doing. So. Uh, you know, your TAs are a great place to start. Thanks for sharing. And then we'll move on to the next question, which is from your particular field, what are the next um, kind of frontiers of research or work that everyone's working towards? And then how do you see your field evolving in, for example, five years? Well, climate studies are, um, super important now for fisheries research to see how they will shape the future of um, 
you know, resource extraction. Um, I think linked in with that is aquaculture. Um, aquaculture technology is just growing by leaps and bounds. And um, I think having inroads in that area of fisheries research can be really valuable because opportunities are popping up everywhere. They're very, very creative um, engineers working on, on solutions. Um, those are the two that, that I think about the most um, that I'm not directly working with, but I would like to. Um, same, I would add that kind of climate change is like, we, we don't really know how many different ecosystems or different species. I mean, there's some understanding for certain ecosystems, but there are still a lot of unknowns. So I feel like, um, especially in my field in terms of um, my, the microbial community is kind of, yeah, understanding how they might be responding and um, if we'll see any shifts of the microbial community and what might be some of the implications in terms of some of the process that they do with like nutrient cycling or other um, like photosynthesis or any other. Um, so I think that's kind of like a big question. Um, I also see that there's um, a need to do more um, interdisciplinary work. I've noticed that um, I'm, I'm particularly interested in marine conservation and something that has been key is to kind of uh, sometimes a lot of the, it, there's a lot of issues that could be very complex. So um, kind of having a understanding or there's been like a, a push to just have a much broader understanding from a, either from the science, but also from like also society, how are the communities interacting with the ecosystems and um, kind of more socio-ecological, but um, similar to what Emily was mentioning about economics, there's been a huge sort of uh, research happening right now in trying to like, how do we evaluate or give an economic value for certain um, ecosystems in a way to kind of address or push for certain policies that can better protect the ecosystem. So. I think there's, there's, yeah, like this whole interdisciplinary and just trying to kind of connect um, all these different issues so that we can better address climate change. I guess um, the prospects for my field is kind of answering the question in the chat there is my, um, my research mainly focuses on developing life detection techniques. So I guess ours, um, our goal in the next like five years or so is basically to help NASA design craft that proposed craft to essentially go to um, icy moons such as Europa and Enceladus to basically make these experiments that could be run on the surface to try to detect life. Um, and that's kind of the big, the big uh, question for my research. And yeah, so it's a little bit more, it's a little less earth focused, I would say. But what's what's interesting about it is that we kind of look at like the environments on Earth um, to essentially like kind of like looking at these extreme environments as, on Earth as windows to these extraterrestrial bodies. So I guess hopefully in five years we'll have something on Mars or Europa and then we'll be detecting for for life and maybe we'll find something. Um, <clears throat> that's interesting to think about that the way you know we're going with that. Um, you know, I think that um, what's been said here, you know, the climate change has been brought up, at least, you know, when we're considering what's going on this planet. Um, and I think we're, you know, in this science is, you know, trying to take this head on right now. We're learning of new ways of doing it. But from the science side, you know, we, I think we recognize that this, you know, this is a future of where we need to be thinking and thinking in new ways. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, what was also brought up is this multi idea of multidisciplinary on things. Um, connecting science and social aspects, um, science communication, call it, you know, figuring out ways of communicating to the public, not just talking to the public, but convincing the public, you know, the way TV shows do. You know, in the TV show, <clears throat> you get to know the characters, and when they go through things, and you know, somehow you're drawn into that. You can be drawn in pretty quickly. Within a couple hours of watching a show, you're caring about what's going on um, with these. And so, you know, figuring out ways of, um, you know, talking to the public about, about these things is maybe, you know, perhaps the, the best thing we can do. Um, and, you know, talk, the, let them understand, you know, kind of our language, um, the language of science um, and, and what we're talking about. 
I might also say that um, connectivity. Um, you know, we're, you're looking at, you know, different people who study different things on this panel, but things are connected and things are connected in much more intricate and strong ways than we thought of in the past. Um, the microbiome, you know, microbial world on the surface of seaweeds um, is unique from just, just outside of the seaweeds. And they have these different um, communities and these communities process nitrogen and carbon and different elements and lead and mercury and iron all differently. And so, and then these things can be important in driving the way ecosystems work. You know, thinking about ROVs, there's areas that, that we can't explore. You know, my, my lab, we have a little ROV that we send down to kind of tell us if we're in the right habitat, but the idea of using ROVs and things that become automated to be our eyes and ears. You know, the reason why we don't know so much about the ocean is you know, we just can't get down there. Um, we're just not spending the time underwater that, that we need to. You know, we're spending a lot of time at a very few places that we know very well, but we don't know a huge portion of the world. Um, so, you know, I think the advancement, what's gonna go off in, in the next five years, um, it's hard to predict the future, but um, I think it's gonna come and realize and kind of the bringing together the voices and the ideas about how we integrate science and how we talk to each other in science and share, and then how we talk to the public to, um, to you know, have, this, have the same conversation and you know, to convince them of what we're doing. All right, thank you. And then the next set of questions is more uh, geared towards students interested in pursuing the marine sciences, um, especially from high school to college. So um, what are some key steps that you recommend that students do, um, as, especially as they apply to uh, colleges this year um, and any sources that could help them? It can go. I think I'm, I'm just kind of thinking from my experience when I was trying to apply uh, to college, I um, I try to, so it can be a very um, kind of stressful because <laughs> um, you're trying to find a college and something like for me, I needed to find um, scholarships. So that was kind of one of the main thing. Um, but um, so it was mostly guided by what scholarships were available for certain college. And, um, and I kind of went on that road, but um, even in the college, the university that I attended it, that you know it didn't have like an official marine science I I also look at whether universities had um, like a, a research station or anything that they do in terms of like natural science and and sometimes you you do find universities that you know if they're not offering that kind of major that they do have other um, uh, research stations that could allow you for that um, um, research opportunity if you know that you know that that's kind of the, the path you want to follow although when you're like in high school I feel like I, I didn't really know 100% um, that that was what I was going for um, but I think something that could be helpful is that you know if anybody has questions I kind of created like a spreadsheet of different schools that had certain majors or like I know certain schools that offer marine science I'll be happy to like share that if people are kind of looking for um, what programs might offer them um, the kind of training that they are looking for. Yeah I would say in terms of if you're if you're um, transitioning to college and you're really set and you really want to do something in the marine sciences field um, in terms of colleges to look at would be something like uh, University of Connecticut Avery Point because that's like a dedicated marine science campus as well as UMaine there's like a dedicated marine science campus and like research facility um, but there's plenty of other programs where there's those facilities but I would as Natalia just said like if, if you want to do the marine sciences definitely look for something that has like that dedicated um, workspace and I think what's also important um, in terms of especially if you're going to like a really large uh, state school like what I did, I think it's doubly important that you, um, again, if you want to get into the sciences and get into working in lab spaces and going to graduate school, um, definitely to get into a lab as early as possible because it's quite difficult to stand out when you go to a school with 30 to 40,000 students. So I think that's quite important. Yeah, I agree, Luke. I went to a huge school, UCSD. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> it's hard. It's very competitive. Um, honestly, sometimes I wonder what it would have been like going to a smaller university that was like less, 
prestigious and standing out more, you know, and getting more um, tailored support from faculty and staff. So I think that a little bit I was chasing when I wanted to go to UCSD, I was like chasing a name, but I didn't, and that was because I was ignorant. I didn't really know. I felt scared to, um, to, to go to a smaller school that didn't seem to have as big of a reputation. Um, and honestly, that's my biggest advice is don't be scared. And like Luke was saying, a lot of the, um, if you want to get a PhD, if you, uh, a lot of the, his uh, cohort are, um, you know, not marine science majors. So if you're not really sure about exactly what you want to do, you can still major in something a little bit more broad um, and move on to marine science later. Um, and, and that can be very, very helpful for you, especially if you want to do interdisciplinary work, you know, you'll be a really well-rounded person. So I think, and this just goes back to what ultimately Matt said about, um, you know, being open. That's the biggest thing, I think. And um, to go off that, I think it's, I think it's more important uh, in graduate school, but uh, I think uh, chase, like, chase the program and the faculty, really, because, like, for example, like Avery Point, you know, people think of University of Connecticut just like a big fratty party school, but um, when you get down to it and, like, you, you work closely with professors in the marine sciences field, um, those names are really important in terms of if you're applying to, like, a graduate program. Um, there are some people at that university, for example, that have pioneered a, spe a specific field, so if you're getting your letter of recommendation for grad school from one of these professors that are really at the top of their game, that's what matters, I would say. That's what's a bit more important, especially for applying to a graduate program. Um, yeah, so I think that you've gotten some pretty good advice um, there um, and you know, the, by the other speakers. Um, one thing I might say is, you know, I, I, for a while I was the director of undergraduate advising in biology, which means that I oversaw the, undergrad, the biology advising. Um, we had about 1,800 biology students. Um, and we have a number of um, uh, special emphasis in marine, in marine biology. And a lot of the students that we see um, come in, you know, they want to get involved in a lab. I see them in their junior year. Um, and so they're coming into their junior year and they're just getting to know who's there because you really don't know what is available until you start to meet people. And you can't meet people until you start kind of going to, you know, getting in the door. And so the, by the time they're in, they're kind of pigeonholed and they're kind of in that lab. And, you know, it, it, it's in, it's in, um, you know, it impacts you, right? It's in very influential, the lab you're in. You tend to become interested in those things and you tend to kind of toward down that path. Um, when there's a lot of other paths you could have taken. There's a lot of other things you could have done. Um, and it's just that, you know, that you, you kind of waited a long time to, to step, to, to get started. You know, it's at uh, San Diego State, um, I don't know, I think a number of people here in San, the San Diego area, when is that correct, um, that we have some people from the San Diego area? Um, if we do, you know, you, there's a UC San Diego, there's San Diego State here, and there's University of San Diego. Um, you know, there's also uh, Point Loma Nazarene. And all have you know things that you can get involved in and if you do you know go in your your freshman sophomore year um, I would recommend that to you too um, if this is something you're interested in because you'll start to realize oh do I want to do this or do I, do I love seagrass or do I love big mammals and birds and birds do I like being in a title do I like going out on boats um, and you kind of start to figure these things out and by the time you get a junior and a senior and you want to go into that class and start kind of getting to know that, that side of the field um, and getting to know it deeper and maybe pursuing that as, as a career. I mean, you've kind of had some, some experience to make your a decision on. And so um, I mean, that would be the one thing is, you know, uh, be open and, and allow yourself to vary back and forth um, and, to, and to get involved early. Um, those, those that, yeah, I guess I'd leave that there. There's a really concrete strategy that I, I wish that I had um, employed, or I, you know, I just wasn't savvy enough when I was 18 to know to do this. But, um, you know, we're all, I guess, taking for granted when we say like, oh, just 
just find a program, find some faculty. It's like, how do you do that when you're, you know, the programs you're looking into aren't in the same state as you? Um, and, you know, the internet is this amazing resource now. Um, if you're, if you don't know where to start, if you know you want to do marine science, but you're not really sure because there's so many different options, which one you want to do, um, get more familiar by reading current articles and then going back, like digging into the article to find the paper that uh, it's sourced from and then find who the authors are and figure out where those, where those authors are doing their research from. Maybe it's from a university that has a lab that has some topics that you um, find interesting. Maybe there are um, partner labs that have other topics that you find interesting. So that's a great, I think, way to um, get familiar with the names. Um, and, and then that's a great conversational point too, when you get to that university as a freshman, maybe you can go to that, um, the author's labs and say, hey, I read, your, um, I read your research paper years ago. And it really was uh, important for me in, in coming here. Can I be, it's hard to say no to that. How does somebody say no to that? I came to this university to work with you. <laughs> So that's another strategy that I wish that I had employed. Great, thank you. Um, so Luke has to leave really soon. So I just want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us and talking about your experiences. Um, and then for everyone in the in the session, if you have any questions for Luke or any of the panelists um, later on, we can find a way for uh, for you to get th get your questions answered. Um, so yeah, and then we'll move on to the next question. Um, so, how should students uh, take the most advantage of their last senior year in high school? So this is kind of going off of what we were talking about previously. Um, wh what should we do in high school that can set us up for success? I can, I can answer this question quickly and then I'll, I'll have to head out. But um, I would honestly say just uh, enjoy yourself because <laughs> when I, um, I think once you apply to college and like you're, our, you know, you're, um, you have your applications out and you're just waiting to hear back. I guess if you really want to keep going, as I mentioned in the chat, I would definitely do some coding. Um, definitely learn some computer science because that is just a universal helpful tool in any, any field of science. But uh, yeah, I would just say, you know, take some time to enjoy yourself because it's kind of like, you know, the last time before you get into college. And uh, with that, I'm going to have to head out. But if anyone wants to um, ask me any questions offline, I'm sure Natalia can, um, she can send you my email or something like that. But uh, thanks for having me. And this is a cool society. I wish we had that in high school. So good luck, everybody. And thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, my advice to uh, students that are preparing for college um, yes, of course, enjoy yourself, but, um, productively. <laughs> I mean, and, and by that, I mean, um, it turns out that a lot of the hobbies that you have already, or hobbies that you may choose to develop in the future can be incorporated into your career, um, especially in terms of science communication, um, and, uh, Related to that, I think that a couple really good um, things to examine as you're choosing new hobbies to be engaged in. Storytelling. Storytelling is great if you're going to be a science communicator, if you want to effectively talk to the public and convince people that your research is important. Um, public speaking is great too. It, it feeds into that and it builds your confidence and it's definitely um, a little bit of exposure therapy in terms of like confronting strangers with your ideas and that's that's going to be very helpful for you um, as you go knocking on professors doors because that's terrifying um, and what's the third thing that I would suggest I don't know it may come to me later but those are those are two that I think are um, two hobbies that are I think really helpful um, I had a little bit of a different sort of experience because I didn't go to college right away. I actually took a 
a, a two years off. Um, and I just want to say, you know, if you don't feel like you're ready, I think it's okay to take a year off and do something different. Um, when I was in high school, I was working with this um, organization that works, um, they had different kind of projects. Um, they mostly towards like the environment and how you work with communities. And so I volunteered and went to Italy to work at a farm and kind of developing sustainable tools for agriculture. But I was just like helping and planting tomatoes and like, but it was, it was a really cool experience to do. Um, and I got to meet like very interesting people. So, um, you know, there are other sort of opportunities out there if you just kind of want to experience things a little bit before going into college. Um, you know, I would echo that. Um, you know, it's as far as, um, you know, being uh, <clears throat> just a well-rounded person, you know, we talked about, um, let's talk about hobbies and taking time off and making, you know, kind of feeding your human soul, your, your whatever makes you, you. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I interview students who go through college and then they want to go to grad school and they come in and um, one, a question I ask every single one of them is what, what are your hobbies? Um, and every one of my students will tell you, you know, and it's because I'm looking for, you know, when you're looking for people to work with as any kind of any job, but you're working in a lab and you have a bunch of students working in the lab, or you're going to go out and you're going to get a job and you're going to work together and you want to do, you know, in biology and go in the field, you know, um, personalities matter, you know, who people are matter. Um, and, you know, being able to share things and having interests to talk about and having interests that you have that's outside of marine biology is great. Um, after college, I graduated UC Santa Barbara. <clears throat> you know, I worked a couple of job, odd jobs. I um, worked for a ski tour, a ski company, and played ultimate frisbee, um, and did other things for a couple of years before I went up back to grad school. Um, and so, you know, sometimes, um, you know, depending on where you are, um, you know, and you're looking, you're looking to take the next step. You know, it's um, sometimes you, you know you're not ready, um, and I don't know who. People, you know, I'm not speaking for any one person, but you know, <clears throat> it's not easy as it's been echoed earlier. Um, the academic path, you know, to just through college, and then if you want to, you know, move, pursue further, beyond, you know, go beyond that. And if you want to do grad school, if you want to get kind of into the administration and kind of the lead scientists and things, um, you know, it's not an easy path. It takes time. It's it's it takes sacrifice. Um, and so, you know, there are periods of time in your life when you get to be you. And you get to feed your own soul. Um, and so, you know, cherish those. And I would say take advantage of those. And because um, um, the hard stuff will come. And it's good to fall back on having done that. Yeah, that's what I wanted to add that I had forgotten, Matt. Thank you. Uh, it's that if you're, I mean, I know Natalia quite well. And um, I know that her PhD path is really challenging. And it's great to have hobbies that can give you um, personal goals that you can then achieve and feel proud of because the process of getting your PhD is like really long and arduous and you don't really see the light at the end of the tunnel for a very long time. So if you can reward yourself or feel fulfilled in your personal hobbies um, along the way, that's a really valuable way to cope. Um, and it, I think that um, being able to develop your hobbies to a high degree of, of skill and proficiency also demonstrates how independently you can work on something you're passionate about. And I think that matters to um, the people that end up mentoring you because they typically will see that passion in one way or in another. And um, if you're passionate also about marine science, you can usually expect that um, people who are really, really uh, driven in their hobbies can also be driven in their work. Thanks for sharing. And so that was the end of our prepared list of questions. Um, so now we're going to open up uh, the Q&A part, uh, which we've kind of already done. But if you have any more questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself, or you can share your video if you want, or you can type it into the chat. I wanted to answer a question. There was a question about art and science. I think Ella um, had a question or something on that. And I, um, I work, um, I think it's sort of 
there's this kind of need on how we better communicate science to to the public and especially art is like a very um a great way to kind of communicate it um i was gonna drop this link um this in new york there was a i volunteer in this organization where they offer kind of different workshops on how you can create art from um, microbes so you will grow them on agar and kind of depending on the pigments of the bacteria you will create kind of different art and the project that i was working on was kind of to um, bring people awareness about this kind of hidden world. So people were collecting samples in the subway or other parts of the city, and then they had like this cool exhibition. And um, I know of other, um, there's this cool bio design competition and I, I, you have to be in college, but it's, it's pretty cool. It's open for undergrads and you know, you submit something between art and science and, um, I think it gives you some small support to do something like that and but I'll drop those links um, if you're interested. I would say that um, if anybody is interested in what and more uh, um, about getting involved in marine biology and you're San Diego and you want to know what's happening at San Diego State um, you've got my name Matthew Edwards um, just you can just google me at San Diego State or kelp forest ecology at San Diego State um, <clears throat> and um, get in touch with me. Um, I'm the undergraduate, uh, I'm sorry, I'm the Marine Emphasis Coordinator. And so I can kind of tell you what we're doing. And we do have um, people coming in and doing volunteers. It's a little bit diff difficult right now with COVID, but um, as that those things begin to relax, um, I can help you um, get involved in doing stuff at, at State. We do bring in a lot of people. Okay, so please email me. And I apologize, I, have, I do, um, for that. I wasn't able to attend the whole time. Okay, thanks, thanks for, for coming. Yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for coming. All right, everyone. So I don't know if people have, I think we answer most of the chat yeah, questions. There aren't any new questions. Um, so last call, if you guys have any more questions, um, type them in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and say them. Um, but if not, then I think that would be the end of our event.